It's April 1st, 2015. The Seattle Office of Labor Standards opens its doors. This is actually a photo of the building where the office lives. So um, Seattle actually passed its first two labor standards laws before it had an Office of Labor Standards. So paid sick leave took effect in 2012. And then in 2013, Seattle passed its ban the box law. So these first two labor standards laws were actually enforced by the Seattle Office for Civil Rights, right? This was an institutional arrangement that was problematic, right? Because these laws were enforced, were enforced as civil rights laws, rather than labor standards laws, and civil rights laws most often focus on the treatment of an individual, while labor standards laws often deal with company-wide violations. Like if you have a minimum wage violation, it typically impacts an entire company or an entire class of workers. This created issues, right? And that is a tale for another time, but I wanted to note it. Okay, so the Office for Civil Rights is enforcing paid sick and ban the box. Then in 2014, through the rise of the Fight for 15 movement and lots of great organizing and political pressure, Seattle becomes the first major city in the U.S. to pass a $15 minimum wage. Minimum wage gets all the press, but at the same time, Seattle also passes its administrative wage theft law, which is super important. So these laws take effect on April 1, 2015. On the same day, OLS opens its doors and the enforcement of paid sick and ban the box transition over to OLS. Okay, so just to name it, right? The reality of how these laws get passed is through extensive negotiations and compromise, right? negotiations and compromise between unions and worker advocates and business groups and government officials who have allegiances to a mix of these stakeholders. So theoretically, compromise is good, right? We like compromise. The problem is, is that the voices of very small businesses, especially those owned by immigrants and people of color, are often not represented in these conversations, right? The other problem is, is that the level of compromise that happens, it can make these laws really complex, right? And much more difficult for small businesses to implement. So a couple of examples. So paid sick leave divides businesses into three tiers, right? Your tier is determined by the number of full-time equivalents or FTEs you have, which then determines your obligations under the law, okay? So to calculate how many FTEs you have, an employer counts the average number of FTEs who work for compensation per calendar week during the previous calendar year for all weeks during which at least one employee worked for compensation. So if you didn't fully catch all that, you're in good company, right? It's really complicated. So while small businesses will fall into tier one, right, from 2012 to, 20, uh, 2012 to 2017, paid sick leave only applied to employers with four FTEs. So this calculation of how many FTEs you have was really important for really small businesses, and it was also really difficult to do. So whether or not, you know, so knowing whether or not paid sick leave applied to you was really, really complicated. Minimum wage, and like, and not unlike paid sick leave, it only has two groups, right? It has small employers and large employers, and they're accounted by the number of employees, not FTEs, right? So the complicated problem for small businesses when it comes to minimum wage is that there are two wages for small businesses, right? And these change yearly. So which wage you pay as a small business depends on one, whether the employee or an earns tips, or two, whether you pay toward medical benefits, right? And the medical benefits, it can't just be any medical benefits. So again, they must meet the requirements of a silver level or equivalent plan under the U.S. Affordable Care Act by providing at least 70% of the full actuarial value of the benefits provided under the plan. Again, like what does that mean? Um, you know, we actually had a case that came down to what level of plan of, of, of the medical benefits is the employer paying to? And I had to look into this silver level of the U.S. ACA thing, and I'm a lawyer, and it was incredibly complicated. Like, I still don't know if I got the right answer, right? So this stuff gets tough. And the difficulties for small businesses that have workers who work inside and outside of the city limits becomes even more complicated, right? So this is a map of Seattle. You'll see at the very top, there's that, uh, that red dotted line, okay? So just a quick example. You have a business owner who owns a small sushi restaurant and they were just able to expand, right? And open up a second small sushi restaurant, a second location. Each sushi restaurant has a staff of about uh, of about five people. One restaurant is inside Seattle, right? And one is just over the border in a city called Shoreline. The restaurants are only about five miles apart, but Shoreline has a lower minimum wage and no paid sick leave law. So, right, sometimes when the Seattle restaurant is short on staff, the owner will send Shoreline workers to the Seattle restaurant. And then the question becomes, well, um, you know, does the Seattle minimum wage apply and does the paid sick leave requirements apply to these workers? Well, the answer is different under both laws, right? So under paid sick leave, an occasional basis employer is covered after they've worked in the city for 240 hours. 
And then um, during for the rest of the duration of their employment, then they're covered, right? Starting on their 241st hour worked in Seattle. Under minimum wage, occasional basis is totally different, right? So a worker is covered by Seattle minimum wage if they work two hours inside the city limits, but only for that pay period, right? And after that pay period, it starts all over again. So, right, you can have a worker who's covered by paid sick leave, but not covered by Seattle minimum wage or vice versa, just depending on, you know, depending on the number of hours worked in that pay period. So you can see, right, how complicated these details can become and how easily it can be for small employers to inadvertently violate these laws. So, okay, with that said, I want to take you back to my first minimum wage wage theft case, right? So this was my first investigation of, of minimum wage and wage theft. It was a restaurant case. The, the owners were a couple from Thailand. Um, they had limited English proficiency. You know, their expertise was in cooking, not business, but they had managed to grow their business from one to two locations. Thankfully, they were both in Seattle, right? Um, but across both restaurants, they had about 15 employees, right? No HR personnel, no HR capacity, and the owners themselves were working, you know, 60, 80 hours a week just to keep the restaurant going. So what we ended up finding was the employer had multiple compliance problems, right? They weren't paying the Seattle minimum wage, right? And this is an issue that Ellen mentioned. Um, Seattle had its, has its own minimum wage. The state of Washington has its own minimum wage. The U.S. Had, uh, fed, you know, there's a federal minimum wage in the U.S. There's three minimum wages. So the owner had heard that there had been a minimum wage increase. He Googled it, and what came up in the Google was a state minimum wage. So he actually had increased the minimum wage he was paying workers to the state level, but not to the city level, right? And we we were able to verify his story by looking at his payroll and we saw this increase, right? But it didn't go up high enough to meet this, the city's minimum wage requirements. The other issue was they weren't paying workers for all hours worked, right? So this was a wage theft issue that was really rooted in a lack of back office system. So they had a clock in system, but workers, they often forgot to clock in or clock out, right? So they were saying they couldn't rely on the on the, um, on the the clock in system in order to pay workers. And again, we were able to verify this. We looked at the clock in system and we would see workers would be clocked in for 48 hours, 26 hours, whatever. And so, you know, this is really an HR issue, an employee training issue, but because they didn't have, you know, HR capacity, the way the employer dealt with this was to schedule workers for four hour shifts, right? And then they would pay workers for four hours, regardless of how long the people actually worked, right? But it's a restaurant. And so, you know, how long the workers worked really depended on how busy the restaurant was. So sometimes the workers would work for three and a half hours and they'd get paid for four and that was fine. But most of the time the workers would work for four and a half hours or four hours and 15 minutes, right? And so what ended up happening was over time, the employer was underpaying workers, which was a violation of the wage theft ordinance. And then, right, once we started looking at their payroll records, it also became clear that they weren't giving workers paid sick leave. You know, when we brought this up, the um, employer, you know, said they had never even heard of paid sick leave, right? So throughout this case, the owner was cooperative and responsive, and responsive, right? And they moved quickly to correct all violations, right? They were acting in good faith and they tried and they tried and they did correct and pay back wages as soon as they could, right? And they were actually asking us for help to get access to systems that would help them comply. And like, they wanted to know, how do we stay up to date on our legal obligations? right? We don't want to violate again. So what soon became apparent to us, like just like in San Francisco, is that this case rep was representative of a large percentage of the cases that we were going to be investigating, right? Small employers who didn't understand how to comply with their legal obligations, and a disproportionate amount of those employers were immigrant or BIPOC employers, right? However, I do want to be clear, right, in saying this, that's not true for all small businesses. So Ellen and I were speaking to some agency leaders yesterday, and one of them described small businesses as sitting on a spectrum, right? So on one end of the spectrum, you have, rest you have employers like the Thai restaurant, right? They want to do the right thing. On the other end of the spectrum, though, you do have small businesses that whose business models business model is actually based right in the intentional exploitation of workers. So again, a quick quick case example: we had a case against a family-owned Filipino bakery, right? But the owner was basically trafficking people from the Philippines to work in the bakery, right? These people were working for really long hours. They lived above the bakery, and the you know, the owner said, "Well, I paid for your trip from the Philippine from the Philippines to Seattle. You know, I'm paying your rent because you lived above the." Bakery. Bakery, and so I'm deducting that from your paycheck, which meant that these people were getting paid very little to nothing at all. What ended up happening is there were a couple of people, a couple of workers who were documented, right, who were not brought by the employer from the Philippines, and even these workers were not being paid the minimum wage or giving paid sick leave. So it was one of these workers who were able to approach our office and tell us what was going on. 
Um, and so we started an investigation, right? And it, once the investigation started, the owner did everything she could to drag it out while continuing to violate the law, right? She didn't, she didn't correct the violation until the very end of the case, which took a couple of years. So for employers like this, the big enforcement stick, it's really needed, right? In order, in order to deter future violations, right? By making violating more expensive than complying. In an ideal world, uh, and Ellen mentioned this too, right? Um, in an ideal world, cases aimed at egregious systemic violations like this one, um, you know, against bad actors would make up most of agencies' caseloads, but they don't, right? Often, and that's often because workers face huge barriers to coming forward to report violations when they work for, um, you know, for employers like the Filipino bakery. So, right, what became obvious to us, and again, this is going to sound very similar to, to some ahas had in San Francisco, is that enforcement is a blunt tool, right? And enforcement against employers like the Thai restaurant is a really complicated problem. So on the one hand, you have these business owners who are from historically marginalized communities, and they themselves are also often relatively low wage, right? And by and large, they want to do the right thing, but they don't have the know-how or the resources to always do that. On the other hand, many of these workers, are, many of these workers who are employed by these small businesses, are from the same historically marginalized communities. They're living in poverty wages, and their rights have been violated. Right, so these violations need to be corrected. Right, workers need to get their wages. But the problem that we found was that just identifying the violation and assessing back wages and getting the employer into compliance did not mean that the employer was going to stay in compliance, right? And so what we did was compliance monitoring. We would go back in six months and we would find that about, you know, in about 50% of the cases, the business had fallen out of compliance. And most of the time, this was unintentional, right? Especially for really small businesses. Our second aha was, you know, similar to San Francisco, the amount of enforcement resources being directed at small immigrant businesses was a racial equity issue, right? And that we as an office, we need to grapple with this. We needed to deal with this. And so given these realizations, right, we had two questions. One, when dealing with small employers who have violated the law and they're already being investigated, what can we on the enforcement team do to better achieve sustained compliance, right? And then the other is what, what do we as a broader office do to help employers comply so that they're never coming into contact with the enforcement team, right? That's the goal. Um, you might be able to hear my dogs barking. Sorry about that. Okay, so one last case example. So our strategy for the enforcement team was where possible, we would use the evidence we attained and we obtained in the investigation to try to identify the root cause of the violation and then address that root cause through the settlement agreement, right? So an example of this, another restaurant case, there's a lot of restaurant cases because small restaurant cases show up a lot in enforcement agencies. So this owner was from Southeast Asia. She employed about 10 workers. Um, and during the investigation, the investigator got a copy of the menu, right? And looking at the menu, she realized that the restaurant prices were so low, it was going to be virtually impossible for this employer to comply with all of the city's labor standards laws. What we also realized during the course of the investigation was that the accountant who, you know, who served other small Asian-owned businesses in Seattle and who had the linguistic and, you know, cultural capacities to do so and had the trust of a lot of these businesses, um, had told the owner that she could pay her workers on a salary basis, right, give them the same amount of money every week, regardless of the number of hours they worked, right? She took his advice because why not? She trusted him. But what happened was she ended up treating these hourly workers as if they were exempt from overtime requirements, which is a legal category that did not apply to these workers, right? And this is a very common problem, a very common violation in the restaurant industry, especially for back of the house workers. So um, the accountant also told, also told the owner that because she was waiting tables, she could be a part of the tip pool. But when owners or managers are a part of a tip pool, regardless of whether they're waiting tables, that's wage theft, okay? So ultimately what we found was that, um, you know, the owner had committed wage theft for failing to pay overtime and for taking tips as part of the tip pool. So what we did, right, to try to get at the root cause of the problem was connect her with the Office of Economic Development to try to get her some business coaching so she could fix her pricing issues so that she could actually, you know, pay for overtime. Um, you know, as part of the settlement, she agreed to pay all back wages and to get training herself. But the big piece, right, was to get the accountant training, right? We wanted to get the accountant who was touching all these other small businesses to get training on labor standards laws to hopefully, you know, get broader compliance. In other cases, right, where small employers didn't have a time tracking system or a payroll system, later on, OLS started requ requiring as part of the settlement that the employer implement a time tracking system or contract with a professional payroll service as part of the settlement agreement. 
you know, the problem is, right, with these types of settlements is they take a long time and a lot of negotiating, and it's only certain employers who are going to agree to do all this stuff as part of settlement, right? So it's only it's only touching a small minority of cases. So there's no way that this strategy on its own can lead to widespread change across the jurisdiction. So as an office, right, what we did, again, similar to San Francisco, was um, we had a two-prong approach. The first was in-house technical assistance, right? So you'll see from this slide, Seattle has provided an enormous amount of technical assistance. And the way that it works is that the employer calls or submits an online form, and then Seattle has a team of staff who respond, who respond to these inquiries, right? And they do it on a rotating basis. The problem with this strategy is in line with what we know about complaint-based only enforcement, right? Just as some workers face barriers or fear of contacting the government, so too do some small employers, right? Especially those employers who are from marginalized communities who have had bad experience with the government either in the U.S., right, or in, the, in their home countries. So who knows about this resource, right, and who feels comfortable about using it are barriers that limit the number of small businesses, especially immigrant and BIPOC small business owners, who are able and willing to call the government and tell the government, like, hey, I may be violating a bunch of laws, what do I do, right? So OLS understood this, and so um, it informed another approach, right, um, which was to create a business outreach and education fund. So Seattle had seen success with a community outreach and education fund, which granted money to worker organizations in order to provide education to workers on their rights, and also to help them file complaints when they experience violations. So um, Seattle created in, in late 2016, Seattle created a business outreach and education fund, which provided $475,000 to 14 community organizations to reach small, business owner, uh, small businesses that were owned by low income people from historically disenfranchised communities. After year one, the funding increased to roughly $600,000 per year. Last year in 2021, the BOEF, um, the, the partners who were funded by this fund, engaged over 5,000 small businesses, provided 300 trainings, right? So, you know, they're really, they're really getting out there. Um, you know, one critique, though, of the BOEF, BOEF is that for the most part, it assumes that the root cause of noncompliance is really the, is the lack of information, right? And that once businesses have the information, then they can get and stay in compliance. There's no data to indicate how successful this approach has been or, you know, where the gaps may be. So it's still unclear, you know, how successful the BOEF has been in getting these small businesses to get and stay in compliance, um, you know, but it has been a, an approach that Seattle has continued since 2016.